We'll get started with the next session. This is Natalie Martiniello. I'm the past president of Real Literacy Canada. And I'm so honored to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Diane Wormsley. Dr. Wormsley's career spans many decades where she's made many contributions to the field of Braille literacy. She is the Brenda Brody Endowed Chair and Professor in Special Education at North Carolina Central University, retired since 2015, but still very much involved in the world of Braille. Her talk is titled, I Am Able, Individualized Meaning-Centered Approach to Braille Literacy Education. And we encourage you to learn more about Dr. Wormsley on our website, along with the other speakers. So thank you, Diane, for being here today, and we will turn it over to you. Thank you, Natalie. I'm happy to be here. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Great. And I do have a PowerPoint. I'm going to share that. I'm going to tell you the PowerPoint is longer than what I'm going to talk about today. And it's partly because then if you're interested, there's a little more information on there. And you can also ever, if you ever want to, you can email me and ask about I am able. So I am able, the individualized meaning-centered approach for Braille literacy education. Let me just share my screen here. Okay, can everyone see that? <laughs> Maybe not everyone. I will yes, explain. yes, you are good. Okay, so um, the children for whom this particular approach might be appropriate are not necessarily the children who are doing well in school and learning Braille and having no difficulties, although I've heard people say that <clears throat> they use parts of the approach with them just as a motivator. But these are the kids that often people think are not going to be learning to read at all, which, you know, makes me cringe because I think we should consider that all of our kids have the potential to be readers, no matter um, what their disabilities. We just need to figure out how to teach them. But we use this with children who are mild to moderately uh, cognitively impaired. They're still in the early literacy stage of learning to read, even though they might be older children. They're not necessarily motivated to learn to read Braille because they don't seem to think that it relates to them, but we sense that they have the potential to learn to read. But also there are children that have, you know, been learning to read, but maybe they're not consistently recognizing all letters of the alphabet. The first three girls that we used this with, I called them the A to J girls because they were 16 to 18 years old, but they did not know all the letters of the alphabet. And they really could not consistently decode words or even recognize the letters, but they, they wanted to learn to read. Um, they might not be able to recognize their own name or they might, they might have some words that they can read, but they might not have a lot of them. They may have limited vocabulary experiences and limited experiences in general. Um, and so then there are all those at risk people who are like with additional disabilities, deaf blindness, English second language, autism, uh, SOD, those who are switching from print to Braille at an older age. I think they're at risk for learning Braille simply because it makes it more difficult. Um, and then adults who've lost vision. So, we really want to try to figure out, this was to try to figure out a way to get to these people who are not learning in the more traditional way. And I'm not gonna say that it works for everyone, but we need as many tools as we can. So uh, trying something to see. So the essential elements of I am able, a, a bubble on the screen popped up that says individualization because that's really the key to the approach. This is something that is not, uh, the same thing for every student. It's individualized to the student you're working with. Motivation is a key factor in it. And another bubble popped up on the screen for motivation. Engagement, getting the students engaged in learning to read is another factor. And the final one is success. And I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these. And 
I'm showing it on the screen with individualization in the middle because that's the most important piece of this. This is because you're learning about the student themselves and what they want to be doing. And then you build in engagement and motivation and success partly through individualization. So individualization is really, and I'm gonna go through these very quickly. And what I'm gonna say is we have a handout and on the handout, we have the reference for the book itself, the I Am Able book and where you can get that. And then also for an article that I wrote called The Theoretical Rationale for Using the Individualized Meaning-Centered Approach. Um, because I think that you need to know why you're using something and where it comes from. And the theoretical rationale includes also the research bases for each of these elements that we have in the approach, the individualization, the success, the motivation, the engagement, all of those are research based showing that they definitely help with learning how to read. But part of the individualization is just making this mean something to the student who's learning to read or the person who's learning to read and recognizing that what they come with, their prior experience, is important to them, and it also will help them learn to read. One of the things that I constantly say to teachers is what you bring to the reading experience determines what you take away. And that means that each of us brings a lot to what we read. And if, it's, if what we're reading has nothing to do with our prior experience, very often we're not interested in it anyway. And so we're trying to be responsive to students to find out what is their prior experience? What do they bring? What are they, what's meaningful to them that will get them engaged in, in reading? So, and talking about engagement, again, if it's meaningful to you, if it's, if it's personally relevant, you're more likely to be engaged with it. Uh, and being engaged is a key to being motivated to continue to put some effort into something to do more. So this whole approach begins with meaningful words, which were called key vocabulary words by Sylvia Ashton Warner. I don't know if anybody's here from New Zealand, but Sylvia Ashton Warner was a teacher in New Zealand who worked with Maori students who were not succeeding in learning to read. And she developed this approach using key vocabulary words to help them get into reading. And I picked up on that and said, why can't we do this with Braille? And that was where I Am Able first came about. So again, um, motivation. If you are motivated, it means you're creating your own personal relevance. Um, and I think my slides are messed up. So anyway, you, you're recognizing their personal experience. Maybe I'm still on individualization. I am. Engagement. Personal relevance is the kinds of things that excite you and you get engaged in them and they're a key to motivation. And these are the meaningful words. And I had already done this. Oh, no, there's something here going on. All right. So success. Everyone knows that if you if you have success in doing something, it leads you to want to continue to do it. It makes it more uh, feasible. We all have people that we know who will just keep going and, and trying to succeed no matter what they come up against. But a lot of our kids have gotten to the point where they just don't feel like they can do it. And so we need to make sure that the, the approach itself builds in success, not only as a goal in terms of success in reading, but success for them in learning to read. So it's a goal as well as the means to a goal. And a lot of this has to do with teacher expectations, because very often I find that um, if expectations are low for the students, then people don't try themselves to do as much as they can to get the student to learn how to read. And our own expectations will lead us to not do things that we might normally do if we thought someone were um, capable of learning to read. Motivation, um, really, for those of us who love to read, reading is its own reward. It motivates us to keep going. But for those who are having difficulty, reading is not its own reward. We want it to become that for our students. We want them to see what wonderful worlds we can explore with them and what wonderful things we can do if they can learn to read. 
So all of these items, individualization, engagement, and success contribute. And you know, I would urge you to, if you're interested in learning about this, read more either through the book I am able or through the theoretical approach article to get an idea if you think it's something that might work with one of your students. So I now want to just tell you how it's different from the traditional approaches, not just in the elements that are in it, but how we actually look at it in terms of Braille. So one of the things you'll know is that and I have a thing here that says I am able in traditional approaches, and this is at the beginning of the approach. We move from this piece right here into a whole bunch of things that I'm going to tell you about that are components of the approach. But initially, when we start working with a student, um, we are looking at it being an individualized approach versus the traditional approach where one size fits all. And as I said, it's a meaning-centered approach. The, the word meaning-centered means that we're looking at what is important and meaningful to the students themselves. And often those things are in conflict with the material that they're being taught to read with. So it isn't motivating to them from that standpoint as all. Well. Also, a lot of the traditional approaches are skills-based. Now you will hear a lot today about the science of reading and people will say, well, how does this fit in with the science of reading then? If this is a individualized and it's meaning centered and so forth, I can tell you it fits in. Uh, it's not fitting in neatly because we don't necessarily approach things in the same way, but everything that's in the science of reading is part of the I am able approach. And when you see the components, you'll see them there. It's just, we don't start out in the same way. Kids who are sighted have uh, the ability to see words around them. So when they come to reading, they've already had a repertoire of, of seeing language in the environment, seeing words in the environment. A lot of the kids that we work with have additional disabilities and not only can they not see the words in the environment, they, they can't get around even to explore the environment. And Braille is not always a large part of that environment. So individualized, meaning-centered, and also, we work from whole to part versus part to whole. We start out with the whole word. We don't start out necessarily with the letters and what they mean and what they sound like. Because that kind of thing, if you're not used to seeing letters and not used to hearing the sounds, it's not really as relevant as a word itself, which has some meaning in it. And in reading terms, we talk about. Um, whether it's outside in or top down versus inside out or bottom up, um, the I am able approach really works from what we call outside in. So if you think of the in as the print on the page or the braille on the page, the outside is the person. That's what's coming to this print page. And that's the top down as well. It's coming from the person down to the page. And we consider the person, the important part of this. Whereas inside out and bottom up are more working directly from the print to the person rather than the person down to what is being read. So that's kind of a general way that they're different. And then also the fact that we start with whole words rather than letters and decoding, it doesn't mean we don't get to letters and decoding. It just means that we start out with that whole word. And when we look at it, we're gonna feel it as a whole word. And what we're looking at meaningful words. We're not using those lists of words that are the most frequently um, seen words or power words, because so many of them are not really very fun anyway. Like they contain un, uh, of and the and for and with. And you know these are what we call filler words in I am able. They, they're necessary words, but they get you where you're going rather than have meaning of themselves. We use contractions right from the beginning. We don't start with uncontracted Braille just because this student has had difficulty. A contraction is no more abstract for students than uh, a letter. It's just different. And so we're going to be introducing them to the word the way it looks in materials that they would most frequently get. And some people have a little difficulty with that, but the ABC Braille study has shown that the more contractions a kid learns right from the beginning, the, the better a reader they can be. 
it's a student-centered approach versus teacher-directed. So we're always trying to find out what's motivating the student, what's helping them enjoy this. And it, we say it's versus teacher-directed, but we're still directing this, but we're directing it through the students, um, things that they like. This also makes it a very unscripted approach. And for those people who have tried to use it, it sometimes feels like a roller coaster because you're really letting the student drive you in terms of their behavior. You're using diagnostic teaching. You're making sure that the student is motivated, successful, is engaged. And uh, so what you do from one day to the next might differ. You might go in with a lesson plan um, and find out that something has to be completely changed because of something that happened that day. And I'm going to tell you in a case study, something along that lines with one of the students we work with. So just to give you an idea very quickly of all the kinds of things that are included in I am able as an approach, and I don't consider I am able a curriculum, it's an approach because how you do it is not dictated by the, uh, the um, curriculum itself. It's dictated by how the student is responding to the approach. So we talk about getting started. That's the, one of the first things and incorporating early literacy instruction. And I'll go into that in a little bit more depth because I wanna give you an idea of how you get started. Um, and that can include helping students select their key vocabulary words or phrases because we want these to come from the students. Um, and then introducing them. How do you actually introduce the student to the key vocabulary words or phrases? Because you're having to look at particular techniques. And we'll talk a little bit about that also. Um, then we need to do things like teach students how to track across multiple lines. We need to teach writing mechanics in a meaningful way. And also how to use the Perkins Braille Writer or any technology that you're using that has to be part of it. We want to get students into reading and writing stories as soon as possible. So we collaborate with them to create some key vocabulary stories for them to read and help them write their own stories. And then when we know that students have quite a number of words that they are able to recognize automatically, um, we start looking at the words to analyze them for how they could be useful in teaching phonics and letter recognition contractions. Because as I said, students have to be able to learn how to read all the letters. They have to read all the contractions. They have to be able to know the sounds that things make. We have to be able to decode. It's just, we don't start with it. And then we also need to help the students because many of our students, as I said, have limited experiences to expand their own vocabularies and to understand the things that they're reading. And then we also need to look at fluent reading. So all of these things are part of it. And just to give you an idea, before you get started, this slide is getting started being responsive to students. You really need to get some baseline data on your students. If you're going to demonstrate that something works, you have to show where the student was when you began this particular approach. If you're going to try to write a case study on your student, or if you're going to try to show an IEP team or a, a team about how much progress the student has made, you need to know where they are when they start. So we are looking at baseline data on motivation, phonemic awareness, letter and word recognition, students' interests. We want to assess the intellectual and socio-emotional socio environment and the physical environment of the students to see, you know, what is the classroom they're in like? How much do people expect of them? What kinds of literacy activities are going on already that we can fit into? And finding out whether there's any, um, you know, pushback on using a different approach, because that also can have an effect on how you would teach. And also, where are you going to teach? Because sometimes you can't do this in the classroom. You may have to pull out or if you can do it, you're doing it in a, in a different part of the classroom. So we're also looking at incorporating all of those things that we know are important as far as early literacy instruction. And that includes, among other things, just having meaningful stories and a braille rich environment where students see braille everywhere that they are, um, everywhere they can get their hands on it. So in terms of helping students select their first key words, 
as I say, sometimes the students themselves don't even have a lot of language. We're working with students who might have limited vocabulary. Some of them might be English second language students. So part of what we do is observe the students and try to get to know the child. And in observing them, we see what is it that they show excitement about? What is it that they are really engaged in? When do they smile and, and have fun? And what are the things they're doing? And so the things that they like, the things that they dislike, and even the things that they're afraid of, because sometimes the most important words can be those words which you are afraid of, and you can get control over that word by reading that word. And so it, it creates a kind of an emotion, and then you, know, you feel like this power when you've actually read it. So you get your list to start with, and really, you only need one word to start, but you've got to have some backups, because if you get that one learned really quickly, we have to go to the next one. And here's the part that's tricky about Braille. Because we're trying at the same time to build up some tactile recognition, we want the first words that we start with to be very different feeling from each other. So when we look at the list of words that we have, we can start with whatever one we want, but the next one we pick, we wanna make sure it's different. If you started with a really long word, let's go to a short one because that's where the student is going to be successful in the initial recognition of the words. It's not gonna necessarily be all the letters because they don't know all the letters yet. So we're starting with trying to get them to tactily be able to discriminate one word from the next on the basis of how it feels on, under their fingertips. And so when you're analyzing the words, don't forget to include the contractions because that can build you a very short word all of a sudden when you thought it was longer. So, and I, I talk about the key vocabulary words um, in terms of how they feel, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but when you introduce them, you want to be talking to the student about the word and what it means to the student, and how it motivates them, because this is why the word was chosen. It's something that's meaningful to them. And you, you may think it is. And I'll just tell a real quick story about a little boy that we worked with um, who we thought the key vocabulary word would be bus. But when his teacher gave him the word card, he basically read it and he picked up the card and put it in his finished box. And that was that. So we had not picked a word that was really motivating to this student. And we went through and found a couple other things that we thought were motivating and, and they didn't. But when it came time to play a song that he liked about riding the bus, every time his teacher would say the word beep beep, he would get so excited. And so we gave him the word beep beep and he kept reading it and reading it and reading it. And the teacher said, now I know what you mean by a key vocabulary word. So you're trying to make sure these words really are important to the student. And sometimes things that you think might be important, they'll show you are not. So accept that, be respectful of their uh, choices when they make them. So then you create the cards, you teach tracking. This is another piece of this. When you're teaching the words and when you're introducing them, you want to make sure they're using all four fingers of both hands, that they're reading the line correctly. This is one of the reasons that when we do the, the flashcards, we use lead in line so that they can be moving as they're moving their fingers. We keep their fingers moving. We can always go back. We create lots of cards so that they can look at as many as possible. We're, we're talking about these as we're feeling them. You have to watch out for dots poking out from underneath the fingers because that means you're not feeling all the, the braille. Um, we, for each word, create kind of a, a, a language of how this particular word feels using adjectives to describe the word tactily. So it might be long, it might be short, it might be, um, really full of dots, or there might be holes in there, or maybe there are some lines that they feel, or maybe they're all at the top or they're all at the bottom. There's not a huge number of words that we can use, but it's getting them used to thinking about how these words feel. And we put those feelings together later on into the actual letters themselves. 
So again, you introduce one word at a time and you teach that word. You're not playing guessing games with the students. You tell them what it is and you make sure again that they are successful. And so you keep going across it until you think that they must have a sense of it. They're moving their hands smoothly. They've got the gist of the word. They can figure out where it is in connection with the lead in line. Um, and then once you think they know a word, you can go on to the next one because you don't really know if they know a word until you have something to compare it with. And so another thing we do when we're introducing them is as we get more and more words, we start playing games to enhance their word recognition. We're trying to build some automaticity and word recognition based on tactile um, differences uh, between and among the words. So eventually, you have to get to those letters because you cannot proceed with this forever. It doesn't work that way. So I wanted to talk just about four of the case studies, but it's too much in one time. So we gave you on the handout, there are four case studies that were included at two different times in JVIB. And they were by um, Amy Campbell, she wrote Sarah's story, Vicki DeRuzio, um, and hers was, I can't remember the name of the little girl that she wrote about, Rachel Schless, uh, who is now a professor at Vanderbilt University. Uh, Amy Campbell actually now works for American Printing House for the Blind. Um, and Jill McMillan, who worked with a student um, at in North Carolina. So they each took the time to write up what happened with their students. And I think that's so valuable because doing an approach like this, it's very difficult to do research. It's very difficult to, um, you know, to prove that this is working. All you can do is demonstrate it with case studies. So the more we have, uh, the better it is. But let me just tell you a little bit about two of the girls that we work with. So you can see how this might work out. So Sarah was 12 when we started working with her. She did not know more than 20 letters of the alphabet. She didn't consistently recognize the 20. She did not like Braille. She did not want to come to Braille instruction. She was uh, at a residential school and she would miss the days that she had Braille instruction or make sure she was late because her Braille was first thing in the morning. She would kick her teacher under the table. She did not like Braille. And her teacher was at wit's end and she was taking a small Friday afternoon class with me where we were working on I Am Able a week at a time. And she picked Sarah for her student. So we started in October of the school year. And by January, Sarah had learned eight words that she could recognize tactually from each other. And that was not all. Sarah now was coming to Braille every time she had class. She even told her mother she couldn't be late because she might miss Braille. Her attitude towards Braille turned completely around. Her teacher was absolutely amazed. Um, but her teacher also was concerned because now the things she was doing with Sarah in terms of the words she was learning, and some of the first few words she learned were SpongeBob, pizza, music, uh, and then she decided on her own, she wanted to, to learn how to read the names of all the American Idol singers that year. And so she did learn as many of them as um, she could tell her teacher. And she was writing stories that had to do with um, the things that the American Idol singers like to do. And then one day she came in and she asked for the word colonoscopy. And Amy came to me and we thought, you know, what first reader asked for a word like colonoscopy? Anyway, that's why I have her, Sarah, AKA colonoscopy gal. But, um, you know, one of her family members was getting one. Everybody was talking about it. She wanted to know more about it. So they actually talked more about what is a colonoscopy and so forth. Um, anyway, she became also entranced with some of the contractions she was learning. She learned the IN contraction in some of the American Idol name, the singers' names. She wanted more with um, IN, so she had words like pink and think. And, and as she got more and more into it, she began to ask, you know, what contractions are in here? What, what letters are in here? And she knew 
she had known about 20 letters, as I said. So we were able to use those in the words with her and, you know, remind her of them and have her reading them. And then uh, she also went into some phonics activities. She, um, at the end of the school year, um, the mom was afraid that she was not going to have this continued uh, use of the I am able approach because the, the teaching staff was changing. So she uh, actually put her in a public school where she had a teacher who agreed to continue the approach. I ran into that teacher four years later when, Amy, or when Sarah was um, 16. And at that point, Sarah was in a modified fourth grade level reading program and was doing really well and was continuing to use Braille, um, knew all her contractions, was doing a, a large you know, amount of her work in Braille. So there was definitely a, a success there. And I remember one other thing about Sarah was she asked us if she, if she could have the word, um, let's see, I'm going to blank on it. It was the name of the mental institution that was next to the school. And let's just say it was the Ann Macy Mental Institution or whatever. She wanted that. And, oh, it was Dorothea Dix. It was down in North Carolina. Dorothea Dix was it. And so her teacher stopped and said, okay, we'll learn Dorothea Dix and brailed out a whole lot of cards for Dorothea Dix. And at the end of that lesson, she said to her teacher, thank you for giving me Dorothea Dix. And, and we said, well, tell us why you want to learn about it. Well, it turned out she did her mobility there and she loved the sound of the birds and the, the, the you know, just the peace and quiet of that, um, that area. So that was Sarah. And the, the second one I have, it's a shorter story because we didn't see her for as long, but Belinda was a gal who was, again, around 13, knew no Braille at all. No one had ever used Braille with her before. And she was in a, um, a class of students who had behavior disorders. She herself was often prone to acting out. And her teacher started her with words that related to what her mother did because her mother was ill at the time and was actually very ill and passed away during the time that we worked with her, uh, which was very emotional for Belinda. But she had a purse. Her mother always carried a purse. So she wanted a purse and she got the word purse. And in her purse, she kept keys and keys was another key vocabulary word. She kept lotion and lotion was a key vocabulary word. And I think she had a, a phone and some other items. And the stories would be, I have a purse, you know, and these are in my purse. So she, the number of words that she started out with were very limited. The teacher also had very limited time to work with her. Um, and one day the teacher came to school and the, the instructional aide came over to the teacher and said, you're going to have a new word that she has to learn today because we had a lockdown yesterday. And so she wants the word lockdown. And so the teacher sat down, brailed out the word cards for lockdown. And as she was introducing this to Belinda, she said, okay, so it starts out lockdown. It's lockdown. And as she was reading it, Belinda says, oh, it starts like lotion. And we kind of, I had goosebumps because what it meant to me was she was making connections now between the sounds that were at the beginnings of the words. So, you know, phonics is a possibility when you can do that kind of thing. So she was doing more than just, just mechanically reading the word. She was getting more out of it than that. And so this is a girl I wasn't able to follow up on, but I thought that story in itself showed the potential that she had for more and how it had engaged her. And that was the kind of thing that, that we were interested in. So the other thing I wanted to mention is that, you know, this is a very short presentation for me. This is usually at least a two to three day workshop when I go through the whole approach, but APH on their hive, has a professional development course with uh, continuing education units that's free, I believe to everyone. I know at least certainly US and Canada, I would have to um, ask someone from APH about people from other countries. 
It's got readings from the I Am Able book. There are video presentations or quiz questions, and we go through all of the different components in the approach. And um, also, APH has what we're calling the I Am Able kit, which includes the book. And this is a description of the catalog number and the what it does as far as reading instruction. Um, it's the book and it's either available in print or on flash drive. It's also now an ebook on a Kindle version book uh, through Amazon. Um, and then it has a teacher instruction booklet for it. Uh, also the APH Word Playhouse Kit, which is something that helps with phonics activities. Um, there are four non-slip desktop sorting trays so that you can play games, and they're the size of a four by five or a four by six um, flashcard. So those are listed here also. That's a virtual email. And then at the end of the handout is my email, dpwormsley at gmail.com. And I am more than happy to have anybody um, you know, email me or whatever. And I do have at the end of the PowerPoint, when you see it, you'll see the other components are very briefly uh, discussed. There's a lot more in the book about how to um, implement the approach with readers, but I'm gonna close this down. How do I stop sharing this? Right there. Close it down now and just see if you have any questions. I feel like, it's a lot to go through in half an hour. <laughs> oh my goodness. Thank you so much, Diane. It was so interesting. It always is so interesting. Um, so much information shared. I, I also can speak from personal experience that the I Am Able book is a wonderful resource for anyone who hasn't uh, checked it out yet. Um, I have lots I could say, but I will leave it to our wonderful audience who I'm sure has many questions. So we will turn it over to Anthony who will um, call on people who have questions. Ah, uh, we have a hand up from uh, Tara P. Tara, there we go. Hi, yes. Um, I'm just curious if um, the, my student um, is reading Braille and, um, but I'm just curious if this approach can work um, to, enhance his uh, spelling? Well, I think anytime you're doing a different approach, you're going to include spelling in it, of course. Um, whether or not it will enhance it depends upon if, if he's having difficulty, what those difficulties are. I mean, spelling is one of those odd things. Uh, we, you know, when we were doing our ABC Braille study approach, one of the things we looked at was spelling. We found out that our kids who were Braille readers were really not bad at spelling at all. Like people are saying that all oh, Braille kind of uh, makes it harder for people to spell. And it certainly does have some orthographic um, difficulties in terms of prefixes and suffixes and things like that. But um, I think it depends on how you focus on the spelling and uh, so forth. I'd need to know a little bit more about the student um, to, right. to be able to answer that. But hey, right. you, okay. know, you can always try something. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's fairly good at sounding out words. Um, uh -huh. And he did really well when we were doing spelling as a unit. But then it doesn't, he, he doesn't keep, he doesn't retain it and put it into his his writing. He's He still sounds things out. Um, you know, very phonetically and spells things. Yeah. If you're um, using the yeah. same vocabulary words that you're reading initially from and you're having him write them, if he's got the capability to do that, that may help mm. also. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Next, uh, Denise Baudry. Hi, Denise. Uh, you're still muted. Maybe still muted. Okay, Denise, well, can we'll you unmute yourself. Alt A with JAWS, Command A with Mac. 
Okay, well, we've got some other hands, so we'll we'll, we'll come back. Um, next, I'm not sure who this person is. Mimiani? Monique, can you hear me? Oh, it's Monique. Yes, there, yes. yes. Monique Mariani, yes, from Los Angeles. Uh, first of all, I was fascinated by this uh, presentation. It's really very, very interesting. But I have two questions. Uh, one is, uh, would it, this program be valid also for literate adults, but who are newly visually impaired and who have never uh, read Braille, Braille. And whose main difficulty is really more the sense of touch than a problem of uh, problems of literacy. And the second question is, well, you talked a little bit about it, about spelling, but for example, if they read words like mother.5m, how are they going to, how, the spelling of the word is going to stick to, to their mind. Well, when you teach writing, I'll answer that one second, the second one, because it's easier. When you Thank teach you. writing, you're going to teach them how to spell the word. You're going to talk about what the dot five M stands for. So you're, you're teaching them to read it initially, and then later you'll be teaching them how to spell it. You have to really do both or they can't, they can't type on a, a keyboard, you know, they can only braille. Mm -hmm. So that's easy. For adults, yes, I think this would be something, when I think about someone who's lost vision as an adult and is learning to read Braille and is afraid that they might not succeed and is, you know, has already lost many things and is, you know, maybe still emotional, I would want to at least start them off with something like this. And, and part of the difficulty comes from the systems of rehabilitation where, you know, you don't have a teacher all the time, or you you only get Braille if you ask for it, you don't get a chance to try it out. And I have known several rehab instructors who have used the approach when they first start working with adults to get them motivated, to get them interested. Uh, uh, I had a teacher I was working with recently use it with a woman who was a college professor and had lost her vision. And they had started initially with just learning the contractions, learning the letters and so forth. And she wasn't really interested. She wanted to learn to read, but she just was not interested. So the, the attempt was to take the things that were in the lectures that she had done, the PowerPoint slides that she had done, and start learning just some of those words and talking about them. And the, the, um, the learner's attitude changed significantly when she was doing that and it it was motivating to do that so I think that it is an approach you can start with obviously there are a whole bunch of things you have to get into if you're learning to read again so I hope that helps thanks next uh okay. Anna oh, okay thank you very much thank you um uh, hello did you call Bonjour. me, Anna Papadionisiu? Yes. Hello from a uh, night, uh, from the night in Greece. <laughs> and um, okay, I don't know, I, I'm Greek, so uh, I don't know if you covered this question in a way, uh, but um, I read uh, your slides that you said uh, to cover one word at a time uh, to focus in a word, right? When when you are in the introduction of the word to the student, the first time the student is learning it, you start and you you focus on that one word. Okay. okay? And so then, my question, so my question on it was, um, what obstacle do you want to simplify this way? Is it the phonics part, the meaning, or the pattern? Could you say that one more time? Yes. What is the obstacle this method wants to simplify and tackle by learning one word at a time and focusing on it? Is it, there are three obstacles and I want to ask you, is it the meaning of the word that you want to focus and cover the phonics or the pattern by using this? Method. Okay, so when we start out with the one word, we're going to be introducing the student to what the word looks like in Braille. 
So this is a word that the student already knows the meaning of, but we want to reinforce that meaning when we're teaching the word. When we're introducing that, we also want to focus, we're focusing on several things at a time, and this can be a little bit difficult. We're focusing on how the word feels, you know, because we're looking at the whole word, we're not talking right now about the, um, the letters of it, but we, we will have the students say the word and we will tell the word. So let's say the word was um, uh, swing. The student liked to play on the swing. We would be talking about it. This is the word swing. And we introduce it so that they use their hands across the word and read across the page. And when they find the word, they say swing. Then we're talking about how does that word feel to you? Is it long? Is it short? Um, you know, are there lots of dots in it? What do you notice about the word that stands out to you? Something that will help you remember that word the next time you see it. So we're doing very gross tactile features initially to get them used to feeling braille and how it feels underneath their fingertips. And then we will expand that as we get more and more and more words. I don't know if I'm answering your question though. But we're not gonna start with phonics initially. We're not gonna start with decoding. We're not gonna start with saying what letters are in the word or what contractions are in it. We're just going to look at how the word looks on the page, feels to the student on the page. Okay, you covered me. I just was wondering because I, I, I'm not uh, blind and as a sighted, I always thought that uh, it's very easy for them because they do not say uh, the, the blind uh, do not read the word. I, I, as a sighted, I thought that uh, they were reading uh, very rapidly. Uh, not the letter. They, they could detect it by what is missing and what is added. So during the wait. So this is why I thought that um, uh, if I was a teacher with this way, I would want to tackle and underline the phonics of it and not the and not detect that this is the word. They can capture the word rapidly. This is what this is why I wanted to answer to, to read to 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 learn your philosophy. I think that people have a, a difficulty with this sometimes at first because, and, and when I do this teaching, I always have teachers teach each other under blindfold to see what this is because it gets them to realize you can do this. You actually can do this. You can actually recognize the word tactily and then you can differentiate it from the next word. What you're doing is building up a memory of tactile recognition and different features of Braille, which you're then eventually going to turn into letters and to contractions and to phonics and sounds. And sometimes like the word lollipop has lots of straight up and down lines in it. And you can feel those. And that actually is the L. So you can connect that to the L. You don't stay there at that tactile recognition point. You grow that into letters and contractions and then decoding of words. You have to be able to decode. You have to be able to do phonics, but you don't have to necessarily start with it. And what makes the approach important for the students is that the words, they want to read these words. They really want to. They're important words to them. So, okay. So, well, I, I, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank well, you. Thank you so very much. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, I don't, I don't have any other <laughs> hands up here, so now Sorry. you can continue. <laughs> uh, no, no. It's, um, it's, uh, can I ask a last question? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I am sorry to be so, <laughs> to take so much of your time. But my problem is, for example, I teach adults and I teach them, let's say, once a week for uh, one hour or twice a week max maximum. If we in, do we practice this method, how are we going to distribute homework, for example? Because it seemed to stabilize on one word or two words, but what kind of homework can you give them for the week for, in order for them to prepare it? 
I'm assuming that you're doing more than just reading. You're probably teaching writing as well. Yes. So some of the homework might be writing of certain letters that you're eventually going to have and some of the words that you do that doesn't have to be necessarily reading. But remember, you're going to have more than one or two or three or four words. If it's an adult, you'll be lucky. They might be taking home five words to recognize. Mm -hmm. And they can have someone help them to make sure they're recognizing them correctly. Or if you could use a pen friend, you know what a pen friend is? Yeah, of course, yes. Could put the dot on the card so that they can read it and see if they read it correctly and check themselves. You're trying to build up accuracy of recognition of these words that you're giving them. Mm -hmm. so, so you, you'll find more things to do with them because you're not just working on the word cards. You'll be working on tracking skills and you'll be working on other things that you can give them to take as homework. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Ex excellent question. And, and also you. you can you can probably you know start incorporating those words onto labels in the home and create a braille rich environment for them as well. So they start using it in practice too. Mm. Um, thank you so much, Diane. That was so interesting. I wish we could continue this discussion. Yes. Um, but thank you everyone also for your questions. And again, Dan, for sharing all of this information. So I will turn it over now to Anthony for some more door prizes. And thank you, Natalie. Thank you so much. Thank you.